Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper. Today I'd like to tell you something about the Cross of Lothar uh, and all the different stories that surround it. But before I start, let me remind you to subscribe to my channel. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like. And if you have any suggestions for new subjects for other videos, some artwork that is your favorite and you want me to talk about, then please leave that in the comments. But now to our main story. If you ever have the chance to visit Aachen in Germany, you're probably going to visit its cathedral. And today that's a much larger building, it, but it's all built around this one surprisingly small chapel that was once the palace chapel of Charlemagne. And he had this chapel built in the, uh, in the 8th century um, and it's an astoundingly beautiful little chapel. I'm trying to show you this in, in a few pictures, but you really have to go there to, to appreciate what it looks like. But to give you a slight description, there's two levels to the building. There's the ground floor for more ordinary people and clergy, which has its own altar dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And then one floor up, there is the area that's only for the emperor and maybe his wife or children. And it has its own altar dedicated to Christ. That makes it, uh, gives it a hierarchy in its architecture and it places the emperor literally above everybody else. And this chapel was already 200 years old when our story really begins. Because 200 years later, in the year 1000, for the occasion of Pentecost, another emperor, Otto III, gave this cross to the treasury of this chapel. Now, Otto III, emperor, as I said, um, he succeeded his father, who was called Otto, and that Otto had already succeeded his father, who was also called Otto, so this one is Otto III. Um, he became emperor, crowned as emperor, uh, when he was three years old. Of course, then someone else um, ruled in his place, but he took the reins of power at the ripe old age of 14. And um, by the time that he donated this cross to the chapel in, in Aachen, he was 20 years old. When he gave this to the chapel, it was part of a, of a number of gifts that he gave to this, this treasury. There was a, a grand ceremony in the uh, in the chapel and had been preceded by a, a, a procession that went through the city where they carried this cross high above so everyone could see it because that is what this is this is a what's called a processional cross it is fairly big it's 50 centimeters tall um, it's made of an oak core so it's wood on the inside then a layer of silver and then that silver is gilded so there's gold on top of that, and then encrusted and set with gemstones and pearls and a number of geme or cameos. Um, it's impressive from a distance, but close up it becomes even more so, because you can then see how many tiny details it has. There's this, this pattern of gold filigree, it's called. Th 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 those are the, those curly bits you can see. And it's made of tiny beads of gold, sometimes made in strings, and they are soldered to the main golden structures. Some of the most extraordinary parts of the gems are the ones that are carved, and this cameo in particular, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. First, let's look at the other side. I hesitate to call either side the front, because it's not entirely clear which one is the front. And which one is the back because one side is decorated very expensively very lavishly and the other is simply engraved but that part the engraved one you might say is the important part because that's the business end of the of the cross because it shows the crucifixion which of course is the the image it should display we can see jesus on the cross he has just died you can tell by the fact that he's bleeding from the wound from his side and that wound, of course, was when he was pierced in the side with a lance that either to prove that he was dead or 
to hasten his end. Anyway, when he has the wound, he's supposed to be dead. And that's why his head is hanging low. And it's um, a strange image to see Jesus suffering on the cross or being dead on the cross, because that was a new thing for its time. It's in a sort of transitional period when uh, before Jesus was always seen triumphant on the cross. You see him very much alive and crowned and and being triumphant. And the suffering Jesus that we are much more used to, that came into fashion around about that time. Um, what you can also see is that the hand of God comes down from above, from a sort of, um, well, I, I suppose they, they intended to be heaven, it sort of looks like flames, and a hand comes down and holds this, this wrath of, um, of laurel, the sort of thing you give to someone who's victorious. He hands it down to Jesus, and in the middle you can see the dove of the Holy Ghost. It's actually the, the oldest representation of the dove in this sort of scene that we know of. Um, one of the strange things you see is that on the sides, on these, on the sides of the cross, there are two different images, two circular images representing two different gods actually Roman gods, Roman, Greek, they're from mythology. There's Apollo and Diana or Artemis, and they represent the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon that cry in this case, the moment that Jesus died. It's a clear reference to well, ancient times, to the ancient Roman Empire. But it's certainly not the only reference to the ancient Romans, because if we turn it around again and we focus on the the center of the cross, you see this this cameo. That's what it's called. Uh, it's a it's a, a typically Roman form of art where they would take these semi-precious stones that have different layers of color in it, and you carve them to make use of those different layers of co color. And in this case, there is a brown layer underneath, then a white layer on top, and another brown one on top of that. And you can see how they cleverly use those three layers to make this image. It is an art form that the Romans loved. It is not an image of Jesus. It's a Roman emperor. In fact, it's the very first Roman emperor called Octavian. He renamed himself Augustus at some point, well, actually, when he invented the office of emperor um, and Augustus means the elevated or exalted one. It has been argued by some that this image was placed here by mistake, that for some reason they thought this was an image or portrait of Jesus, but that's simply not true. Um, it did happen once in a while. In some cases Roman images, mostly of women, have been mistaken to be figures, portraits of the Virgin Mary. But in this case, that's very unlikely because there's an image of Jesus on the on the reverse. And that shows a very different face and a beard and it, it clearly a different face from, from this one. So the other side really represents what they imagined Jesus looked like. Now, this cameo represents Augustus and Alto knew it, definitely. It is placed there in the center of this cross because it was very very expensive it's the most expensive part of the entire thing because by the time that they made this a thousand years ago that cameo was already a thousand years old so it was priceless and otto otto the third was very much fascinated with the emperor with being an emperor and the roman empire see otto the third was emperor of what became known as the Holy Roman Empire. That's one separate from the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire at the time still existed and had an emperor who lived in Constantinople. The idea of a, of a different emperor in the West had been more or less forgotten, but rekindled by Charlemagne. Charlemagne um, had, once he had conquered all of Western Europe, he needed legitimacy. 
to call himself something, an, a leader over all the other kings of Europe. And he got that legitimacy from the Pope. He made a deal with the Pope. Uh, they, the Pope would crown an emperor, stating that that emperor was the protector of God on earth, making him this, this sort of super ruler, and in, the, in return, the emperor would actually protect the Pope, so to, because the Pope didn't have his own armies, was never rich enough to have um, any worldly power for real. So it's basically it's a sort of marriage between two forms of power that uh, Charlemagne had come up with, and it still existed in the time of Otto III. And to show that particular marriage between the two forms of power, that's why Charlemagne had this chapel built that I showed you earlier, with these two levels that actually placed him religious in a religious sense above everybody else. Now Otto III very much wanted to link himself to Charlemagne. He, he was his successor in a, in a way, and a distant successor 200 years later, but still it was in the same sort of line. And that's why he had these celebrations in Acre, because Acre was more or less the capital for Charlemagne. He traveled throughout Europe most of his life, but that is where his main palace was, and that's where he had built this palace chapel. And it's also the reason that there's a second engraved gemstone lower down on the cross. It's a smaller one. It's a seal of Emperor Lothar II. That was actually an emperor that was still from the dynasty of Charlemagne. He was the, the grandson of Charlemagne. And it's engraved with a text that translates to, O Christ, help King Lothar. Now, since these are the only words, it's the only name written on the entire cross, that's where it got its name. That's why it's called the Cross of Lothar. But the bigger cameo, the, the really the, the central cameo, that's the link to the very first emperor. Um, as I said, the man who invented the whole idea of having an emperor. Now, Otto III wanted to restore the Roman Empire even further than Charlemagne had ever wanted to. In fact, it said so on his royal seal, on one of his royal seals, it said Renovatio Imperii Romanorum, which means the restoration of the Roman Empire. In fact, he lived in Rome for most of his life, and he had built his palace on top of the ruins of the Palace of Augustus. So he was very much aware of who, whom Augustus was. Um, so that's why there's so many of these links to the old empires and different emperors on this one cross. It's a visual representation that links Otto III to all these emperors of the past. Only one question remains though, and that is which end is the front? There are two ways to look at it. Um, some say that it was carried in procession with Christ to the front and the bejeweled side to the back because behind the cross, the emperor would be, uh, would, would be carried and he would look at his, his jeweled side. Others say that it was just the other way around. Uh, so we really don't know. What I suggest you do is you get yourself to Aachen, see this wonderful chapel of the palace. Then you should also visit its treasury because they have quite a few beautiful pieces there including, of course, this one. There you can see it and decide for yourself which side you think is the front. Before you go off to Aachen, please subscribe to my channel. And of course, if you like this video, then, then give it a like. And um, I hope to see you again soon. Bye.